a good afternoon to you all. I would like to welcome you to our webinar today. And today we are going to be discussing the topic uh, from NIAS PV Genset Systems. So in today's webinar, I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Mohamed Sidat, uh, who is based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, he's our technical sales advisor for taking care of the South African region. And myself, uh, David Mongi, I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, the technical sales advisor taking care of the East African region. So today, together, we'll be taking you through the contents of our webinar today. And the agenda for today will be as follows. We are going to have a brief introduction into PV genset systems. And then after that, we look at the solutions that uh, are offered for a single generator and then a solution with multiple generators. Then I'll take you through the design guidelines of a PV genset system. After that, my colleague uh, Mohammed is going to take over and uh, take you through how to commission the PV system controller, how to configure the inverters, how to set up the failsafe, and then also how to set up automatic disconnection of the PV, how will monitoring work, and then where or in which areas can the PV genset solution be used. After that, we're going to discuss shortly how we offer support. And of course, uh, I would like to mention at this point that if you do have any question during the course of this webinar, please feel free to post it in the questions area. And we are going to do our best to address these questions during and shortly after the webinar. So to get started, I would like to do a brief introduction into the PV genset solutions or systems. And the key question that also your customers can ask you when you're going to discuss a PV genset solution is what is the motivation? Why would I do a PV genset system? So there are three key uh, points that uh, you need to understand or to bear in mind when you are thinking of a PV genset system. And the number one aspect, which is very, very important, is that doing a PV genset system allows you to realize uh, fuel costs as far as the generator fuel is concerned. Also, it allows the prolongation of the service life of the diesel generator. So these two key points um, are what would be most attractive for, let's say, ad customers or system owners. Because when they see the possibility whereby they are able to save on fuel costs, and also the fact that they can have their generators operating for a much longer duration of time, these two would be very, very interesting. And therefore, you can start your discussion into designing a system from them at this point. Also, uh, very, very important, although this might not be on most customers' minds, is the fact that you have the possibility, once you do a PV genset system, to reduce on the emissions that are coming from burning of the uh, diesel fuels uh, used by the generator. So therefore, um, this comes as a benefit for the environment. And for those of us who are conscious about the environment, this is also a very key uh, aspect of a PV genset system. So looking at uh, return on investment, how do you boost then your return on investment using a PV genset system? Because this is one of the key considerations that a lot of customers are going to be able to, let's say, relate with. So in this consideration, we are looking at uh, a system that a PV system that is integrated into a generator system. And we are comparing the cost of uh, energy for both systems. The cost of energy from the PV system, for instance, is just about uh, 0 0.1 kilowatt hours as euros per kilowatt hour. And then for the diesel generator, considering the fuel and all that, we are coming to a cost of about uh, 25 euro cents per kilowatt hour. In this case, uh, the PV system that was installed, and this is actual, an actual system that we can also use as a reference system within Fronius, is the PV size of about 144 kilowatt peak with an annual yield of about 237,000 kilowatt hours. When you look at the total cost uh, in terms of installing the PV system, it came at about 216,000 euros. But the annual savings as a result of doing the PV system on top of the generator, the realization uh, as far as cost savings are about 35,000 euros. 
So bearing all this in mind, we can see that the amortization or the payback period, or what most people would like to say, the return on investment on the solar system would happen in the sixth year. And thereafter, from the seventh year onwards, uh, then you can argue or you can show your customer that the system will actually be earning for them or saving for them about 59,400 euros per year. And if you look at then the expected operating lifespan of the PV system, which is about 25, 30 years, and multiply by this annual uh, saving or earning of the PV system, then this kind of combination between PV and a generator makes a lot of sense. Having said that, let's look at uh, scenarios where the PV genset solution uh, can be used in terms of <clears throat> if you're off-grid or if you're connected to the grid, but then the grid is suffering from a bit of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, blackouts. So we have two possibilities for an off-grid uh, installation. As you can see in this illustration, we have the generator as the source of the, the grid within this setup. And then we have our load that is ideally taking the voltage or the, the power coming from the generator. And then we have the possibility to bring PV inverters. Uh, what, these are the Fronius inverters that are going to be synchronizing to the generator grid. That is the frequency and the voltage that is coming from the uh, grid source, which is a generator in this case. So this is a particular off-grid application. And these are quite common maybe for mines and stuff like that, where the national grid network uh, is not available. Also, we have uh, the possibility to have a PV genset system in a grid connected kind of scenario. But if the grid is suffering from outages, then you can have a, a standby diesel generator. And in most cases, uh, especially urban areas of Africa, this is a, a very uh, common setup in commercial buildings or institutions, whereby uh, because appliances must continue to be powered uh, during an outage, most of them already have integrated a diesel generator as backup. So in this kind of scenario, we do need to be able to differentiate, as you're going to see later, what is the source of the grid, because that is a, an important operation point for the PV genset system. So when you have the power coming from the generator, the PV system controller, as you're going to see later, must be able to know that the generator is now powering up the loads. And when you do have the grid supporting the loads, the PV system controller must be able to know that now the grid is operating and therefore whatever regulations measures we have to take for the diesel generator do not apply at this point. So let's look at a solution with one diesel generator and these we are limiting to a maximum of 1.2 uh, MVA. So this system is or solution is what we refer to as within Fronias as a Fronias PV genset easy and we are going to describe the key parts or the main parts of this uh, uh, Fronius PV genset easy system. And one of the key parts is actually the Fronius inverter, which are going to be converting your DC power to AC and then feeding to your loads. Another key component will be the PV system controller. And the PV system controller is going to be measuring uh, the power flow within the system and therefore enabling the operation to be as optimum as possible. Then you have the diesel generator, which could be the primary source uh, of the power in the system or the grid in the system. But if you have uh, the grid as already mentioned before, then the diesel generator acts as the uh, backup for the grid in case of failures. So the PV system in this case, and the reason for this is to be able to relieve the diesel generator. And by relieving the, gen the diesel generator load, then you're able to save on the cost of fuel that would ordinarily be burnt by the diesel generator for normal operations. We also have the consumers or what are called the loads, and these are like uh, now the, uh, the, 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 the key design aspect because everything designed has to revolve around how much power or energy is required within the system. And this will be determined by the extent of the loads that are going to be uh, powered. So the consumers therefore will be supplied by an optimal mix between uh, the generator and the PV energy coming from the Fronius inverters. Then you have what uh, we refer to as the current uh, sensors or the cities. And these are checking from time to time uh, how much current is going to the loads. And this is also 
communicated back to the PV system controller. And the PV system controller is using this information to be able to either limit or allow more production from the Fronius inverters. Because as you are going to see later, um, the generator has to be operated at a certain minimum load. Then of course we do have the grid, uh, if you're operating in a grid backup kind of scenario, and the grid could be available, but as already mentioned, could be suffering from a limited availability. And of course, the ATS becomes also critical when you have a grid kind of uh, scenario where the generator is operating as backup. And the automatic transfer switch or the backup feedback conductor is the one that is able to distinguish to the PV system controller that now the grid is operating and therefore we do not need to remit uh, PV power into the system or into the loads. Or if the grid fails, then the, the ATS, the automatic transfer switch, is able to tell the PV uh, controller through a, bad, uh, a feedback contact uh, relay that now the generator is operating and therefore we have to respect some minimum operational rules within the system. So what do you need for the PV genset easy solution? So these are the most important uh, components. Of course, you do require the PV system controller. Then we have, as already seen, the current uh, transducers, and these are available in three variations. We have a three-phase uh, current uh, transducer, as we can see here, that can measure a maximum of 250 amps. Then we have a single-phase uh, CTs, available uh, what we call the MC1-55, that can measure from 500 amps up to 1,500 amps. And also we have another variation of single-phase CTs, which are referred to as the MC stroke 180, stroke 80, which can measure anything from 1,000 up to 2,000 amps. So um, the CTs will have ordinary uh, secondary current of about 250 milliampers, and the maximum cable length that should be used when connecting the CT to the uh, PV system controller is a maximum of 25 meters. Also, uh, something else that might be very important in this PV genset uh, system is what we call the uh, genset me measurement extension. And this is an optional component, of course, um, but it's very important uh, for several reasons because it provides additional uh, protection against feeding back PV power into the generator. And this happens uh, especially if you have a very high PV uh, power ratio to the genset ratio. And therefore, assuming that other standard fail safe mechanisms, as you're going to see later, are not working, then the PV, uh, the genset measurement extension is able to immediately trigger uh, a circuit breaker that cuts off power that is coming from the um, uh, Fronius inverters. And therefore, the risk of switching off the diesel uh, generator, uh, therefore, is uh, brought to the lowest minimal level possible. As you know, if you are to have uh, some power going back to the generator from the PV system, especially if you have some big loads that are operating and suddenly they are uh, switched off, then there could be some instances where you're feeding some substantial amount of power of PV power back to the generator. And in these kind of scenarios, you can have the generator switch off. If you have the generator switch off because of uh, feeding back power, then you go into a black up, uh, blackout situation for all your loads. And this is not a desirable outcome uh, of a PV genset solution. So all measures have to be taken uh, depending on the kind of design that you have in, uh, in hand to make sure that at no point the generator will see uh, PV power uh, because of a sudden re load rejection. So uh, let's now look at uh, the solution with multiple gensets. So for multiple gensets, we have what we refer to as an advanced or professional solution. And the advanced solution basically would mean all the benefits that you get with the easy solution. And also, this is also more or less like a retrofit kind of a solution. And it's dependent from whether you're operating from on a low voltage or medium voltage kind of network. And it works with all genset controllers. Just to clarify here is the fact that the genset easy solution, PV genset easy solution, this one works mostly with uh, low voltage grids and of course with just one generator. 
So in this case, when you have an advanced uh, solution, you can use it for, or if you have multiple generators, you can now start thinking about using an advanced solution. So the benefit or the key benefit in this kind of scenario is the fact that you're able to serve even a lot more complexity than with a PV genset easy solution. The next uh, solution will be what we refer to as the professional solution. And this means all the benefits that you can get uh, with the advanced solution, plus uh, the fact that you can also operate uh, likewise multiple gensets. And it doesn't matter the kind of controller that the genset is using. And also the fact that you can also have your PV power at eye level with the generator power. So if you have, let's say, one megawatt of generator power, then you can design something that with a PV power of nearly one megawatt. But the kind of controller that is going to be used here is going to ensure that you have optimal operation of all the power sources. Because uh, in this advanced and professional solution, if you have multiple gensets, depending on how much power the loads are consuming, then the PV, the overall controller, which is the central controller in this case, could be from DAVE or ELAM, which are, these are two manufacturers that uh, we have tested compatibility with our inverters with, are then able to know, in this case, for instance, we have three generators, uh, we should be switching off uh, one or two generators, and the balance of power that is going to be required uh, is going to be supplemented by the PV system to support the one generator that is left in operation. Should the load continue to increase and the PV system is not generating enough power, then the central controller in this case knows immediately that another generator should come online. And therefore things like spinning reserve are also very, very important for systems with multiple gensets. And therefore a day for ELAM controller is uh, the controller of choice for you to be able to control systems with multiple gensets. But let's now look at how the PV system controller operates. And this is a controller, like I said before, is uh, dedicated for systems using only one generator, maximum 1.2 mega MVA, and in a low voltage kind of uh, grid. So how does it work? So of course, the diesel generator is a source of the voltage. And therefore, uh, as already mentioned before, is providing the balance between production and consumption. Then the PV system controller knows the minimum load of the generator or what we call the minimum genset loading, which is about 30% of the rated KVA, maximum KVA of the generator. And of course, this uh, is measured through the cities as already described before. And therefore, what the PV system controller is doing is to calculate the maximum allowable PV production, which is equal to the consumption as, as seen by the cities minus the minimum genset loading. So this equation will tell the PV system controller and, and therefore the PV system controller is going to communicate this information to the Fronia's data manager in the inverter that now uh, our load is this much and therefore I'm only allowing you to inject this much power into the grid. And therefore the PV inverter in this case is now producing something that is less or equal to the maximum allowable PV production as already communicated by the PV system controller. So we can see that the PV system controller becomes a very, very important uh, component of a PV genset solution. And you cannot realize a reliable PV genset solution without a PV system controller. So what are the main tasks of the PV system controller? So of course the diesel generator will be the core component of a PV genset uh, system. And uh, the main task of the PV system controller will be to protect the diesel generator. As already mentioned, if you have a sudden load uh, rejection, there is a risk that some of the PV power that was being consumed by the loads might fight its way back to the diesel generator. So the PV system controller must ensure that this does not happen because when the generator sees a bit of backfeeding, in most cases, the generator is going to trip and switch off. And this is uh, not a desirable outcome of integrating PV power into a diesel generator system. So further task of the PV system controller will be to uh, prolong the operating lifespan of the generator. Uh, also in case of low loads, as already mentioned, we do not uh, want to see the generator being operated below 30% of the rated KVA. 
And then of course the PV system controller has to perform extremely fast regulation uh, based on the power fluctuations. So if the, there is an increase in, in the load, on the load consumption, the PV system controller must, must be able to see this and make a balance of power that is coming from the PV system through the Frodias inverter and also dynamically uh, control that output from the PV inverter. All the generator then must be able to fill the gaps uh, when you have a bit of uh, fluctuations, maybe because of cloud cover and things like that on the PV side. So in terms of the requirements for the PV system control, so the overall system control at, at specific power, this is done by the PV system controller. So, and of course this information as already mentioned is uh, uh, communicated mostly to the Fronius inverter. In actual sense, the PV system controller is not communicating any information to the, PV, uh, to the diesel generator. The only thing that is happening with the diesel generator is the load measurement through the cities and therefore the PV system controller knows that this is the amount of load we have at this point and therefore I'm going to allow the PV inverters to increase or reduce their power output accordingly. So the PV genset system must guarantee a consistent power balance and this has to be both reactive and effective power in the system and also allow for compensation of fluctuations of the load and also the fluctuations on the PV uh, side, on the PV side. So as already mentioned, if you go into scenarios whereby you are going to use multiple gensets, then further control is necess necessary. And in this case, we are not going to be using the PV system controller. We are going to be using third party controllers and mostly recommended either DIF or ELAM controllers. And also as an additional option, this uh, system uh, is not limited to only off-grid applications whereby the generator is the source of the grid, but can also be used in a grid backup kind of scenario where the generator is supporting uh, a not so reliable grid. So looking at the regulation of the PV system controller, uh, as already mentioned, uh, the key task is to protect the diesel generator and the kind of regulation that would happen with the PV system controller would look something like this. So in this graph, we can see quite a number of uh, scenarios whereby we see the load uh, as plotted by this blue line here, uh, consumption within a period of uh, 10 seconds. And then we have uh, in this uh, area here, uh, also dotted area, this is the available PV power uh, within the same period but the actual used PV power is in this solid uh, red line here. And we can see that as the load is dropping, also the amount of power that is allowed to come from the PV inverter is also uh, curtailed or throttled down. And therefore the PV system controller at this point must be able to communicate very, very fast to the Frodias data manager that now we have a bit of reduction on the load as we can see here. And now also your output needs to be reduced. What you can see here is that as the load was uh, reducing, the communication between the PV system controller and the Fronius data manager was not very fast. So we have very uh, brief uh, feedback of power to the uh, uh, diesel generator. So you can see this dip of power going below, let's say the minimum uh, generator loading. And therefore, if we are to have this kind of scenario often, uh, this could uh, trigger or for longer durations of time, this could trigger the generator to go off. And therefore, that is one very critical uh, role that the PV system controller is playing to ensure that the generator is at all time protected from uh, seeing uh, power being fed back from the PV system when there is a sudden drop in the load. Uh, as we can see here also, when there is an increase in the load, here the load had stabilized. And therefore, uh, if you take what the generator is supplying and also what is allowed to come from the PV system and you add these two, then you'd get what is the power consumption at this point. So as you can see here also, as the load increased uh, somewhat uh, at this point, also the production from the Fronius inverter is allowed to go up uh, slowly to cover or to match uh, the sudden or brief increase in the load requirements. And therefore the PV system controller is monitoring the scenario through the communication of uh, uh, current going to the loads by the cities 
and is using this information based also, as you're going to see later, my colleague is going to explain how to do the commissioning, based on the size of the generator that is integrated in the system, then allow a certain uh, amount of power always from the uh, Fronius inverters to be added into the network. So how can minimum genset loading be achieved? So uh, this is very, very important uh, that you remember this, that always when you design uh, a PV genset system, that there is a certain min minimum genset loading that has to be achieved at all times when the generator is operating. So you need uh, a PV system controller that is along the, com uh, the consumption path. Uh, so as you can see, so the PV system controller as well as the cities will be along the consumption path. Then the PV system controller is linked through a communication uh, line, uh, that is Modbus RS485, to the Fronius Data Manager uh, 2.0 and up. And then there has to be a dynamic uh, power control of genset load, and therefore power elimination by the Fronius PV system controller. So as already explained, depending on the scenario, if there is a, a drop in the load consumption or if there is an increase in the load consumption, and depending on availability of power on the PV side, then the PV system controller is able to allow the Fronius inverters to respond accordingly. So the connection between the PV system controller and the Fronius data manager is very, very important in this case. So let's now look at uh, design guidelines for a PV system, uh, PV genset system. What you need to know, as already mentioned, uh, very, very important. Uh, the genset minimum loading is very critical. So generators must not, must not be operated below 30% of their nominal power for any long durations of time. And this is to avoid uh, pure efficiency as far as uh, fuel consumption is concerned, and also to mitigate uh, possible increases in wear and tear because of uh, the generator operating below a certain threshold of loading. In terms of uh, consumption, you have to look at what is the load profile, because uh, for you to be able to integrate PV power into a generator system, we want a scenario whereby we are going to use as much of the available PV power during the day as possible. And therefore, we need to analyze the load curve or the load profile and be able to know how much in terms of maximum PV power can we integrate into this system. Just as a hint for you, if you do not have, uh, let's say, these energy meters or, uh, that you can use to log data, you can simply achieve uh, uh, this kind of uh, load profile analysis using Afronia's data manager box and Afronia's smart meter. So when you ha once you have this combination, you're going to be able to relay uh, load consumption data into Afronia's uh, SolarWeb. And from SolarWeb, you're going to be able to get very well laid out curves that you can use for your analysis. So just to repeat, the most important segment of the load profile will be what is happening during the day. Because of course, at night, there is no PV production. And therefore, at night, the PV or the Fronius inverters are not going to play any role in mitigating or reducing the cost of uh, consumed fuel. Of course, the sizing of the PV system uh, uh, to the maximum or average load must be reasonably sized to fill the gaps between what is the genset minimal mode and the average or the maximum daytime load. So therefore, this tells you that uh, it's very, very important to define what is your load profile or the load curve during the day and to see what is the maximum or the average. And therefore, are you going to work with the average load or the maximum daytime load? Because this can, can, can vary. You could have just a few peaks during the day, but then just designing a PV system around a few peaks during the day might not be very, uh, let's say, economically viable in terms of if you are looking at a short uh, return on investment period. So in this graph, we are going to see a few things. Uh, we are analyzing an active power kind of scenario with about 1.8 megawatts. And uh, this is sort of a load curve for just about a day from midnight to midnight. So um, very, very important. We have to look at what is the minimum genset loading. So in this case, we have just about uh, 450 there about uh, kilowatt. And then also, this is going to guide us in terms of what is the inverter power KVA that we should have in the system. And also we look at what is the average daytime load. So if, if you're looking at the average daytime load, 
we are looking at the period from seven in the morning up to about uh, maybe seven in the evening when you have uh, availability of sun power or sunlight. So in this period, we are able to work out what is the average daytime load. And then of also because of that, we can work out what is the maximum kilowatt on the PV side, kilowatt peak that we should be having. Also look at the peak load demand. So as I mentioned before, you cannot just design a system based on the peak load demand, but of course your generator must be able to, to handle any peaks in the, in the load demand. And therefore the PV system is sort of left to take care of a consistent uh, average daytime load uh, that can benefit most from any available PV power uh, during the day. So from that kind of analysis, we see that uh, if you are to design a system, our minimum genset load would be about 540 uh, kilowatt peak, uh, I mean kilowatt. And therefore, uh, because we have a total load or generator size of about 1.8 megawatts with a power factor of uh, 0 0.8, we are looking at a generator size of just about 2.2 MVA. And the peak load during the day uh, is about 1.7 megawatts, as we have seen in the graph. And therefore, taking out uh, the minimum genset loading of about 540 kilowatts or 0 0.54 megawatts, we are left with the possibility to inject or to bring on board 1.16 MVA of inverter power. Then looking at the average daytime load, uh, we have about, from the graph that we have seen, 1.2 megawatts. And therefore also taking the 1.2 megawatts as the average daytime load and taking away the minimum genset loading of 0.54 megawatts, then you have about 0.66 MVA of inverter power that you can bring into the generator system. So therefore the question becomes, between now the peak load demand and the average daytime load and the inverter deductions from the two of 1.16 MVA and 0.66 MVA, which is the right one to use? So the right one to use in these two scenarios will depend on what is the load profile like and hour to hour resolution. So uh, my recommendation would actually be to look at what is a consistent average daytime load. Do not design a system uh, just based on a few peaks during the day. Allow these peaks to be taken care of by the diesel generator, but allow the PV system to be able to handle a very consistent, uh, maybe sort of an average daytime load. And this is going to, be, to guarantee you that the return on investment is going to be very quick as opposed to when you design just a very big system because there are a few peaks during the day that are you know, creating a surge in power demand. In terms of the PV array, uh, a reasonable size uh, of the array depends on the inverter power. Of course, the minimum and maximum uh, oversizing capability of the inverter, as you know. So if you have, for instance, the Fronia Simo, you can oversize the, the DC side, uh, the inverter input power by about 150%. If you have the Fronius Echo, you can oversize by about 137%. And this oversizing, of course, is very important. Uh, as the system ages slowly over time, then you have degradation on output of the PV uh, panels. But if you have an oversight system on, on the DC side, this is going to guarantee a consistent output on the AC side of the inverter. Also, in case of uh, uh, low insulation or irradiation during a particular day or period of the year, an oversized system on the DC side is going also to guarantee a sort of consistent output on the AC side. In terms of the economic figures, you have to look at what is the localized uh, uh, cost of energy uh, on the PV side as well as the, uh, the diesel side and compare these two to be able to know if your PV system is going to make uh, sense in, in the short term and also how much time is going to take for you to recover your investment from the PV integration into the generator system. So at, at this point, uh, I've come to the end of my section, but I would briefly like to launch one poll and I would appreciate if all of you can take your time and uh, share your feedback with us. So the question is, uh, how often do you encounter or come across installations with more than one generator? We have few three options whereby we can choose very often, rarely, and never. So depending on your choice of uh, uh, results, 
we have, uh, as already mentioned, uh, three different kind of solutions that we can offer for single or multiple generators. And if you do require further details after this webinar on, depending on if you're working for a solution with multiple or single gensets, we are still very happy to engage you to realize uh, the best solution. So I'll leave it on for just about uh, 10 more seconds and I'll close it and share the results with you. All right. Okay, just five more seconds, then I close it. Okay. So I'd like now to, to share the results with you. And we can see that the biggest percentage uh, of our attendees today uh, say that they rarely come across uh, installations with multiple gensets. Also another uh, big percentage of that 6% says that they never come across this kind of uh, scenarios with multiple gensets. But of course, we have uh, also a good number at 16% of our attendees today who say that they come across very often uh, scenarios where uh, multiple generators are being used. And therefore, um, as I said, if you do require any further assistance, depending on when you are designing your PV genset system, we also at the end going to share some kind of checklist. My colleague is going to mention that, and you can use that for you to get assistance with your design work for PV genset systems. So at this point, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Mohammed, who is going to take you through the remaining section of the webinar. Uh, Mo, if you can please uh, join us. Hi, David. Um, yes, thanks for your presentation. Okay, so I'm going to start with um, how to commission the PV controller. Okay, so firstly, when commissioning the PV controller, there's three main steps or well, three main areas that you do need to cover um, for the system. Um, the first one being to set up the network configuration um, correctly. Um, the second one being to set up the fail-safe um, mechanisms. And the third one is to set up the um, genset controller. So as you can see in this picture over here, you have your two main components for the system, which will be your Fronius inverter that you will need to set up correctly, and also the um, PV controller, which you'll also need to set up correctly. When it comes to setting up the um, IP address on the controller, it's very important that you do take note. Um, there's two methods of setting up the IP address. The first one is using a static IP address. And the second one is to use a dynamic IP address. Um, so you might ask, why is it important to set an IP address on the controller? Um, the reason we need to set an IP address on the controller is that so you can gain access to the controller using your laptop in order to do the settings on the web user interface of the controller. Okay, so it's not for reporting any data online. The PV controller cannot report data online. Instead, what reports data online would be the data manager card in the Phonus inverter. So if you are going to go for the static IP address during commissioning on the PV controller, please make sure you do take note of the following. Uh, you will have to go to the screen of the controller and press these um, specific arrows, go down to configuration of network. Um, then what's very important to note is where it's asked for DHCP, please select no. And when you select no, you then have to set a, a specific IP address that you decide on and also set a specific mask and gateway that you also will decide upon. Okay, what's very important to note is that you'll also need to set up a network on your laptop. Okay, so when you are creating this local area network on your laptop, please make sure that the mask on your IP v4 network settings on your laptop does correspond to the mask um, that you do set on the PV controller. Please also make sure that your gateway also corresponds. And the only thing that not should not be the same should be the IP address. Obviously, your first three bunch of digits will be the same. The only difference will be the last three digits. Okay, as you know, when it comes to an IP address, your last three digits can be anywhere between zero to 255. Okay, so for this case scenario, I used 003. Okay, so for example, if I'm then going to my laptop, um, it will have the exact same IP address settings. The only thing that will be different will be these last three digits. Okay, because please remember in a network, um, each device in a network has to have a unique IP address. Okay, and where does the uniqueness come from? It comes from the last three digits of the IP address. 
Okay, so if you are going to go for the static um, IP address method, please make sure that you then um, connect an Ethernet cable between the controller and between your laptop. And once you've done that, you then need to open up Google Chrome and type in the IP address that you set on the controller. So in this example, I set this specific IP address, and hence this is the IP address I will enter into the search bar. If you prefer to go for a dynamic IP address method, you can also do that. Um, so you might ask, when is it a good scenario to use a dynamic IP address? This is whenever we have a router on site. Okay. So if you have a router on site at the client, it's easier to use the router as a gateway between your laptop and between the controller. So as you can see in this picture, I'm using a router to provide a means of communication between this controller and the laptop. So if you are going to use a router, please make sure that under the network settings of the PV controller, under DHCP, please select yes. Once you do that, this IP address, the mask and gateway will automat automatically be given to the controller from the network. Okay, so this is a much easier method of setting up communications um, to the controller. But I just want to add a point here. Please make sure that when you do go to a client, especially a commercial client, you can't just tap into the router with your laptop. Okay, this is why the static IP address, which was on the previous screen, might come in handy. Okay, once you've connected um, the controller to your laptop, um, you then will be brought up to the web user interface, which will look something like what, I've, what I'm showing you on the screen. So it's very important here is that you will get what we call the CDP setup. Okay, um, you know, sometimes it might be applicable that you might need to do an upgrade of the version. Okay, so I always suggest when you do receive this controller, please make sure you just upgrade the version. If you have any issues, if you don't have any issues, you don't really have to upgrade the version. What's very handy as well is the system status. If you click on the show system tech status, it will show you the entire system status and whether there is, is communications or not between the controller and the inverters. If you then look down, um, this is where we can then set up our CTs. Okay. So for example, in this case scenario, the CTs will need to be placed on the path of consumption. And if, for example, the primary current on the CT is 250 amps, you will enter 250 amps. And this controller will then know what the primary current coming in is in order to produce a specific value that the controller will understand. When it comes to the board rate, which is your bits per second, um, with Fronius Modbus, we operate at 9,600 bits per second. Okay, so this will have to be 9,600. Then looking on the right hand side of the screen, it will ask you for inverter type. You'll need to select Fronius MB, which stands for Fronius Modbus. The inverter power, this is the entire power of all your PV inverters added together. And number of inverters, how many inverters do you have installed? And then having a look at the control for the phase, if you're going to do three phase or single phase, this is where you will select it. And if you are doing three phase, I would suggest you do use active power three. If you go further down, uh, we will get injection margin and allowed injection, which I will explain a bit later on. And we can also enable power factors. So if you want to enable power factor compensation, you can also do so. We will also have a look at the reverse current relay a bit later on. Uh, but what you do not have to worry about is the auxiliary, auxiliary load relays. Unless you want to use one, you can go ahead. And also with the data logger. I mean, you can choose to do data logging every one minute or every two minutes or five minutes, etc. What I'm showing you now is basically what was said on the previous screen. Um, so the, these are just the definitions of each of the menus. Um, and as I said earlier on, I was going to tell you about the injection margin. Basically, what the injection margin is, it's a safety margin. Um, so for example, if you set the injection margin to 3%, it will always pull 3% of a specific value from the grid, even if you have enough PV production. Okay. Then what you then get is allowed injection, and this is what is allowed to be injected back into the AC source, which could be the genset or the grid. Obviously, we can't inject anything into a genset because that will damage the genset. However, we can inject back into the grid. Okay, so this is where the next important section will now come. So I'm just going to have a further look at the allowed injection and the injection margin. What are they and what are the differences? The allowed injection is based on a calculation that will differ from system to system. Um, so with allowed injection, it asks you to take the negative of the minimum genset power, okay, 
over the total power of your PV inverters. Then the second definition, okay, before I get to the second definition, I just want to run, run you through a case example. Let's say we have a 100 kilowatt genset on site and we have a 30 kilowatt PV system. Okay, and we decide we want to go for a 30% minimum load. Okay, if we take 30% of 100 kilowatts, that's going to give us 30 kilowatts. So 30 kilowatts will go on the numerator and 30 kilowatts will then go on the denominator. If we take 30 over 30, that will give you a allowed injection of minus 100%. Okay, so if that's going to be the case scenario on the controller, and let me just go back to the screens. Um, you can see we have this allowed injection input. You will now enter minus 100%. Now, having a look at the injection margin, as I said earlier on, the injection margin is just a safety margin, and this will make double sure that nothing is injected back to the genset or to the grid if you're in a zero feed in scenario. So, in this example, I'm taking 60 kilowatts, a consumption of 60 kilowatts that is measured. If I set a 3% injection margin, if you take out your calculator and calculate 3% of 60 kilowatts, that will give you 1.8 kilowatts. So, that means that I will always have 1.8 kilowatts being pulled from the grid or from the genset, irrespective of what my PV is able to produce. Okay, obviously, if you're running on the genset, you're still going to have your genset minimum load, which we calculated to be, you know, 30 kilowatts in the earlier calculation. So if you're taking 30 kilowatts and adding 1.8 kilowatts to it, it means that in this case scenario, the genset will be producing 31.8 kilowatts. The remaining power will then be produced by the solar, which will be 28.2 kilowatts. So going down, um, I have two case scenarios. So the first case scenario for the input um, would be if the genset is sent to the main operation and the grid is set to the secondary operation. And this is achieved when we use a NO contact. So in this case scenario, the injection margin was set to 3% when the genset is running and to minus 100% as in allowed injection when the genset is running. All of a sudden, the grid comes back. The genset obviously switches off. The ATS goes to the grid. And all of a sudden, we now allowed a allowed injection of 3%, which you said. And because maybe we're in a municipality which does not allow any feed in, um, the allowed injection is now 0%. Okay. However, if we do reside in a municipality which allows us to feed in back into the grid, we can now set the allowed injection to 100% on the secondary. Moving on, how to configure the inverters. Firstly, which Fronius inverters are compatible for the Fronius PV genset solution? Um, we're going to start off with the Fronius SIMO. Okay, that is compatible. Please make sure you do select the microgrid M250 as the um, country setup. Also, the Fronius Eco is compatible. Our new Fronius Taro 50 and 100 kilowatt will also be compatible. So this will really allow you to go to you know large PV genset systems which would be really good. Uh, what's also compatible is the smaller Fronius Primer inverters as well as the smaller Fronius Simo inverters. And those the primer is your single phase and your Simo is your three phase. When it comes to establishing the inverter to inverter communication, it's very important to make sure that you take note of the following. Please make sure that you have at least one Fronius data manager Okay, in your inverter system loop, okay? If you have more than 15 inverters, I would suggest that you use more than one data manager, okay? So in this case scenario, let's say that we have 45 inverters, okay? We now have 15 inverters attached to each data manager, okay? So there you can see the data manager one, data manager two, data manager three. And each one of these data managers are controlling a maximum of 15 inverters. We will now connect these data managers point to point using Modbus RTU okay, to establish data manager to data manager communication, which will then send all this information to the Fronius PV system controller. Having a closer look at this mod of at this um, data manager to data manager communication, uh, one can see the point to point connection. So if you look at your um, your M0 plus, 
is connected to the M0 plus of the next data manager. Your M0 minus is connected to the M0 minus of the next data manager. And then obviously to the Fronius PV controller. And also your ground is also connected point to point. Okay. What's very important is that your MO plus and your MO minus need, need to be um, on a twisted pair cable. Also, please note um, that if you look closely, you can see that we have this 120 ohm resistor. Please make sure that you do switch it on at the first data manager and switch it off at any data managers that are in between the first data manager and the PV controller. Okay, so we can see in the second one, this 120 ohm resistor is now switched off. Please make sure that the master switch is selected on master for each data manager. Okay, in this loop. If you're now looking at the Fronius PV controller, which is at the end of the loop, um, it also has 120 ohm resistor. However, this 120 ohm resistor is now bridged between your MO plus and your MO minus. That's between port one and port three. Please remember without the 120 ohm resistor at the beginning of the loop and at the end of the loop, we cannot achieve um, Modbus RTU communication. Now moving on, how to set up the fail safe. Uh, basically, what is the fail safe? Firstly, um, so the fail safe is a mechanism which will allow a Fronius inverter to fall back to a safe value if there ever had to be a failure in Modbus communication or if there ever had to be a failure in the solar net communication. Please, please remember the Modbus communication is the communication that will be used when the Fronius inverter communicates with the PV controller. And the solar net communication is used when Fronius inverters communicate with each other. In the first case scenario, um, with a fail safe on the Modbus interface, if the Modbus communication has to fail or it has had to break, um, the inverter will then fall back onto a safe value, which will prevent any backfeed to the genset. Now looking at the fail safe on the Fronius solar.net ring topology, the inverter will run on a fallback value if the solar net ring is failing or it is disturbed. When it comes to setting up the priorities on Modbus control on the Fronius inverter, this is under the web user interface on the data manager. Please make sure that you select controlling by Modbus as the top priority. Second should be dynamic power reduction and third should be IO control. Okay, so um, in this case scenario, we don't really have to use IO control. Okay, what's very important is that we need to set up the dynamic power reduction. Okay, so the dynamic power reduction will take over if there is a failure in Modbus communication. Okay, so if there is a failure on the Modbus, the system all of a sudden can now not use Modbus as a communication criteria. It will now fall back to the dynamic power reduction, which you will then set to limit for the entire system. And what is the total DC power of the system? Let's say it's a 20,000 watt peak, you enter that. And what is the maximum grid feeding power if your Modbus had to fail? So if your Modbus had to fail, you want your inverters to maybe go back to 1% of output power. So if you take 1% of 20,000 watts, the inverters will then fall back to an output of 200 watts, Okay, which obviously will not harm the genset in any way. Now moving on to the fail safe on SolarNet. So what happens when the inverter to inverter communication fails? Uh, what you now need to do is you need to go to each furnace inverter and you need to set a fail safe on the solar net. Okay, so you need to enter a specific code on the furnace inverter, and to do that, you need to tap the third button on the furnace inverter five times. Okay, once you do that, you will then be given an opportunity to enter an access code, and this access code you can request from your furnace technical sales advisor or even from furnace tech support. Once you have that access code, you can then go about and set the fail safe on the solar net. Once you're in the menu, you need to scroll down to fail safe, enter DM fail safe mode. It will then bring you to another screen and it will ask you the DM fail safe mode, you select permanence. Then you go down to DM fail safe behavior and you select disconnect. Now moving on, how to set up automatic disconnection of PV. So it is suggested to use some form of automatic disconnection of PV whenever you have a large PV to genset ratio. 
And personally, I would define a large PV to genset ratio to be if you maybe have greater than 80% of PV, gen, of PV penetration in your system, then you should look at using our extension device. Okay. And this extension device will provide further protection to the genset. Okay. So this protection, well, this extension device is called the CVM Mini, and I have it indicated here on the screen on the right. And the CVM Mini will basically have CTs attached to it, which will measure power that's going to or from the genset. Okay. Hopefully, you shouldn't have any power going to the genset because then you're backfeeding, but obviously, you should have power coming from the genset. When the CT detects a negative value on phase one, phase two, or phase three, it will automatically trigger a response from the system, okay? And it will automatically shut down the PV. So this is a kind of safety feature in order to make sure that you 100% will never get any backfeed to the genset from your PV. Um, as you know, if you feed back power to a genset, it can harm the genset. And as you know, feeding back power to a genset can sort of turn the genset into a motor, which is a sort of an irreversible um, phenomenon, which obviously requires a lot of maintenance on the genset, et cetera, which can be, again, very costly. As I said, the CTs leading to the genset will be connected to the CVM Mini, as indicated over here. And again, this is used to detect negative, negative back. The purpose of the CVM Mini is that in case of reverse power to the genset, the PV controller triggers a circuit breaker that immediately disconnects the PV system Obviously, the CVM Mini still needs to be connected to the PV controller, and it will need to be connected to the PV controller via Modbus RTU. So if you remember in the earlier slides, we saw that port 5, 6, and 7 were empty, which will now just be filled up by the CVM Mini. So the CVM Mini also con um, communicates over Modbus RTU with the PV controller, and the PV controller obviously still communicates over Modbus RTU to the Fronius inverters. However, what's important to note, on the one side of the communication, we have comms, which is set at 9,800 bits per second. Then on the other side of the, of the communication between the controller and the extension device, we need to set a board rate of 19,200 bits per second. Okay, again, please make sure that your peripheral number is set to one on the CVM mean. You also need to set up some further settings on the PV controller in order to understand what's coming from the CVM Mini. And what the only thing you need to set would be the reverse current relay. So on the PV controller, the PV controller has outputs that you can use to trigger a circuit breaker. And that circuit breaker, in this case scenario, will be connected to your PV. So you need to select enable reverse current relay. You need to select the stop time, the reconnection time, your max disconnections and also your disconnection timer. Okay, so basically what you're telling the PV controller to do is whenever the CVM mini detects negative backfeed, it needs to send a signal to a circuit breaker, okay? And this circuit breaker is attached to the PV and the circuit breaker can then disconnect the PV as soon as we have backfeed to your jetset. Moving on, how does the system monitoring work? So if you want to get full system monitoring, you will need to purchase an additional data manager box and a Fronius smart meter. This is how the data manager box looks. And the data manager box will have its own 12 volt DC power supply. And this will be connected directly to a Fronius smart meter over Modbus RTU. What you then need to do on SolarWeb, on SolarWeb, when you are commissioning the system, you will have two, two data managers. Your first data manager will be for the inverters that are communicating with the PV controller. And your second data manager will be the data manager box, which will be communicating with the Fronius smart meter. You then combine these two data managers on SolarWeb, so you can then get a full analysis of your production and consumption as shown, as shown above. So as you can see, we can see what the grid or genset is producing, we can see what the previous producing, and we can see what the load is consuming. Where can the PV genset be used? Um, so the PV genset can actually be used in a wide range of industries, but uh, you know, having a look at any low voltage industries, CNI, that's a very com common use of the PV genset solution. Um, also for single genset applications, as my colleague David mentioned earlier on, um, it is limited to 1.2 MVAs with the Fronius PV genset solution. 
again, retrofit, uh, we recommend to use this PV gen set solution for any system that's, you know, between 50 to 500 kilowatts peak, that's the sweet spot. However, you can go to, you know, systems that are greater than 500 kilowatt peak up to 1.2 MVAs. And again, you can also use this for off-grid or backup applications. Yeah, so you can use it for utilities, for off-grid regions, weak grid regions, and unreliable grid security. Also for remote industries, which could be mining industries, oil and gas filling, desalination plants. Again, you can also use this for real estate, for office buildings, warehouses, headquarters, and also for other applications such as hotels, resorts, agriculture, and irrigation systems. I just want to show you a few references that we've done. Um, the first reference is the tobacco processing farm in Zimbabwe. This was done using um, Flonius inverters. So they used three Flonius Simo inverters. They used one data manager. Um, they had a generator, um, AJ Power of 64 kVA. And the PV was 45 kilowatt peak. Okay. Um, they had the Flonius PV system controller, which was installed in the DB box. Um, this commissioning was done in March 2020. And again, they save approximately 60 tons of CO2 per year. Um, the special feature of the system is that this system can be easily scaled up or down as per the season requirements. Okay, so whenever it comes to tobacco farming, you get the on-season and the off-season. So in the off-season, they run their small generator, which is the 64 kVA. In the on-season, or the main season, they then swap the 64 kVA genset with a 100 kVA genset, okay? And still connect it to the same PV setup, okay? So the Fronis PV system controller is very easy to upscale or downscale uh, the system size. Moving on to our second reference, this was in Lebanon. Um, this was a vegetable cultivation farm. Um, so in this um, installation, they used 144 kilowatt peak with a Fronius inverters. Um, that included six Fronius Simon inverters with one data manager. And they used a generator, which was 280 kVA. They also had a, uh, well, they used the Fronius PV system controller to control um, the system. Um, this commissioning was done in December, 2014. Um, the annual yield is over 216 megawatt hours and approximately 114.5 tons of CO2 is saved per year. And what's really unique, nice about this installation is that it has a 40% self-sufficiency rate. Okay, I want to move on to our third reference. Um, this was Lake Plex Spa in South Africa. Um, this is a retail um, industry. Um, and the size of this installation for the PV was 340 kilowatt peak. So here you can see the inverters were installed in a small room on the walls and they had 12 Fronius Eco inverters. Okay, and that was controlled with one data manager. Um, they also had a Fronius PV system controller installed. And um, this commissioning was done in February, 2021. And with the setup there, you know, saving around about 240 tons of CO2, um, you know, per annum. And I mean, the electricity cost that they are saving per month is over 60,000 Rand uh, per month. And, you know, the special feature of the system is that, you know, the system can easily transition between presence and absence of load shedding. Okay. So when the grid is up and available, um, the system can control how much power is being backfed to the grid. And when the grid is not available, the system can then control the communication and prevent any backfeed to the genset. And also to ensure that the genset is running at a good minimum load of 30%. So moving on, um, how does Fronius offer the best support for this type of solution? Um, so we can offer you a full support for your PV genset solution. Uh, we provide good system planning and we also provide a good feasibility study as well as some on-site support and commissioning. If you are interested in doing the solution with Fronius, um, I have shared a handout. Um, you will see on the right of your screen a little handout tab on the GoToWebinar um, widget on the right of your screen. And over there, you'll see a PV underscore genset underscore checklist or PDF. If you download that PDF, um, you just fill in a bit of data. So if you are interested in doing such a system, uh, just fill in the data and then send it back to your responsible technical sales advisor. And then we will then assist you in, you know, going ahead um, with, you know, your type of proposed solution. Okay, so um, as I said earlier on, we can provide you this PV genset checklist. Uh, you send this to us, we can then give you a design optimized solution, okay? Um, again, we can also assist you in the construction phase and definitely, again, in the commissioning phase. Okay, I'd also like to launch um, a quick poll um, before we move on. I really appreciate if everybody could share their inputs.
Okay, so the question for the poll is, what do you think is the ideal PV penetration in a percentage value in a PV genset system? Do you think 30%, 50%, 75% or 100%? And we'll be keeping this question open for another 10 to 15 seconds. Okay, thanks for sharing your answers. Um, as you can see, the majority of today's audience um, have selected 75%. Uh, which again is a good ratio, okay? Um, because that can really ensure that, you know, your PV or well, your genset is running at a minimum load of around 30% and your PV is then filling in the rest of the system requirements. Okay, moving back to the presentation. Um, again, if you do want further support, as I said, you know, contact, um, this variety of content options you can use. You can contact Afonia system partners. Um, so in, in you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, we currently have around 30 Afonia system partners. Um, again, you can also contact your Afonia technical sales advisors, and you can also contact the, you know, Tech Support International for assistance as well. I'd also like to, you know, elaborate a bit more on which areas each technical sales advisor is responsible for. Um, so my colleague David Wangi is responsible for um, all Eastern African countries, as well as some Central and some Southern African countries. So if you are from one of these countries of the year, and if you want to talk about any phony solutions, please get into contact with David. Uh, my colleague, Cyprian Nicolo, who isn't here today with us, but he is responsible for English-speaking West African countries, such as, you know, these countries indicated over here. So if you're again from one of these countries, please contact, you know, Cyprian Nicolo. And again, if you are in one of these countries in the green over here, um, Southern African countries, uh, please do contact me and you know, I can assist you on any phoneous questions or assist, assistance you might need. Again, I'm going to show you our contact details on the screen. So if you, you know, want to call us or email us and chat about any aspect, please go ahead. Um, we will keep the line open for the next five to 10 minutes to answer any unanswered questions but from my side I'd like to thank you for joining today's webinar um, and yes have a good weekend.